Outliers are a common occurrence within many datasets. If we do not isolate them early on in the machine learning workflow, they can cause us headaches and problems later on. There are many ways that we can identify outliers, including normal statistical techniques such as using a z-score or a box plot, but we can also leverage the power of unsupervised learning. And that's what we're going to see today. Hey friends, I'm Andy, and if you already knew that, then welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to look at Isolation Forest, which is a very popular machine learning algorithm for identifying outliers. Isolation Forest is a model-based outlier detection method that relies on decision trees. And what it does is it tries to isolate outliers early on in the process, and due to that, it makes it much faster compared to some of the other density-based techniques. The method selects a feature and makes a random split in the data between the minimum and the maximum values. This process then carries on down the decision tree until all possible splits have been made in the data or a limit on the number of splits is reached. Any anomalies or outliers will be split off early in the process, making them easy to identify and isolate from the rest of the data. So now that we've covered the basics of Isolation Forest, let's hop over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can do it in Python. The first thing that we're going to do is import the libraries that we're going to be working with. In this case, we're going to be working with Pandas for loading in our data and Seaborn for creating some visualizations. And we will also be using Isolation Forest from scikit-learn. So we can run that to import the libraries and then we can begin loading in the data. So the data that we're going to be using for this comes from a machine learning competition that was hosted by Force 2020 and Zeke. And it was about predicting lithology from well log measurements. But don't worry if you're not too familiar with this data, you can apply the same techniques to any data set. So once we've loaded the data in from our CSV file, we can begin having a look at what we have. And the simplest way to see all of our variables is to call upon df.info. And this returns a summary of all of the columns within the data frame. And we can see that we've got a total of 12 columns here. And we can also see the different data types. So we've got well, which is an object, and then we've got depth underscore MD for measured depth which is a floating point number. And we can also see the non-null count or how many actual values we have within our data. So we can see that we've got some that are around about 17,000 and then some that are much lower than that. For example, this column here called NFI has about 13,000. So this indicates that we have missing values within this particular column. As with many machine learning algorithms, we need to deal with the missing values before we actually run them. And the simplest way to deal with these missing values is to drop them. Now this is a quick method, however it should not be done blindly and you should attempt to do a full data analysis and understanding of your data to know why you have missing values and if those missing values can be reconstructed or filled in. So for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to remove these rows that contain missing values. Now this will reduce our data set and that means that our machine learning algorithm will have less data to train with. Now this may not be an issue if you have millions and millions of records, but if you have only a small amount of data, it is something that you need to consider. So we can drop the rows with the missing values by creating a new object called df and setting that equal to df.dropna and then we've got the, the open and close brackets. So this will remove all of the missing rows and we can confirm that by calling upon df.info and having a look at the results. So we can see that we're now down to about 13,200 values for every column. So that now means that we've no missing values within our data. So now that the basics of data preparation has been done, we can now move on to building our isolation forest model. So for this, I'm going to select two columns, N5, neutron porosity, and row B, which is our bulk density, and I'm putting these into a list. And this just makes it easier to come back to if we want to add more variables to this list, or if we want to reduce the number of variables. So we can do either of those, and they, that way they're contained within a single variable. So once we've defined that anomaly inputs variable, we need to then define our isolation forest model. So I'm going to create a variable called model underscore if, and this is just short for isolation forest. Now we may be running multiple models, so it is good to be able to distinguish between those. And we're going to set that equal to isolation forest, and then we're going to set a couple of parameters. The first one is a contamination. And this is the value or how much of the overall data that we expect to be considered as an outlier. And we can pass in a numeric value between 0 and 0 0.5. So if I put in 0 0.1, 
This is going to tell the algorithm to look for 10% of the entire data to be considered as outliers. Next, I'm going to set a variable called random state. And what this does is it allows us to control the random selection process for the splitting of the trees. In other words, if we were to rerun this model with the same data and parameters with a fixed value for this, for this parameter, then we should be able to get repeatable outputs. And I'm just going to set this to a magic number called 42. So if we run that, we've now created our isolation forest model, but we've not trained it yet. And this is where the next step comes in. So if I call upon model underscore IF and then select the method called fit, and that is going to basically train our model. So it needs some data to train with, and we can call upon our data frame, and then we can pass in the variable that we created earlier, the anomaly underscore inputs. And that is basically saying select NFI and row B from our data frame and then train the model with that. After the training of our model, we can now create some predictions and we will do this by creating two new columns within our data frame. The first one is going to be anomaly scores. We will do that by calling upon the DF and then passing in anomaly scores. And that will be the column that will be created within the data frame. And then we call upon our model underscore IF and then we've got decision function. And this provides an anomaly score for each sample within the data set. So the lower the score, the more abnormal that sample is compared to the rest of the data. And any negative values that are calculated from that indicate that the sample is an outlier. So again, we just need to pass in our data frame and we pass in our anomaly inputs and we run that. So now we've got a new column called anomaly scores. And the next one that we're going to create is a column called anomaly. And this will be used to identify whether a row is an outlier or an inlier. And again, we just call upon DF and then we pass in anomaly into the square brackets. And then we're going to set that to model if dot predict. And then we pass in our data frame with our anomaly inputs as the columns. So now that those have been run, we can now start to look at our data. So I'm going to use some pandas slicing to extract these particular columns from our data frame. And this will just exclude some of the other columns such as GR, DTC, etc. So when we run this, we get back our four columns, our N5 and row B, that's our input curves. And then we've got the anomaly scores and whether a point is an, an anomaly. And if a row is an anomaly or an outlier, it will be assigned a value of negative one for the anomaly column. If it is an inlier or a good data point, then it will be assigned a value of positive one. And then we have our anomaly score. So the lower the score, the more anomalous or the more abnormal that sample is compared to the rest of the data. So looking at the numeric values and trying to determine if the point has been identified as an outlier or not can be a tedious process. And we would have to go through the entire data frame to look at the numeric values, but instead we can use Seaborn to create a basic figure. And we can use the data that we use to train our model with, so which is why I've selected two inputs, as it just makes it much easier in this simple example. So what I've done is created a simple function that takes in our data frame, takes in our outlier method as a string, and then our x and y variables, as well as the x-axis and y-axis limits. And this just allows us to make it a little bit more flexible, so we can pass more data or different data types into this and control the limits. We will then print out the different uh, statistics of it, the length of the data, the number of anomalous values, non-anomalous values, and the total number of values within the data. Then we're just going to create a facet grid, which will basically map a scatter plot onto it. And then we pass in some of some extra parameters for changing the axes, setting the titles, etc., and just to make it look a little bit better. So we can run that. And then we call upon that method by calling outlier. And what we're going to pass in is our data frame. And then we're going to pass in the method, which is going to be isolation forest. So our X variable is going to be called NFI and our Y variable. And our Y variable is going to be row B. And then we can pass in some limits. So with this particular data, I'm familiar with the limits of this. So let's set these to 0 to uh, 0 0.8 on the x-axis. And then we'll set the y-axis in an inverse order, as that's commonly how this data is displayed. And we'll set that to 3 to 1.5. So we run that, and we get back the scatter plot. So right away, we can tell how many values and where they are that have been identified as outliers 
And we can see we've got this series of points that are around the fringes of our data set that have been identified as outliers. So all of our good data is here in blue, and then our, our outliers here is indicated in orange. So this is with a value, their contamination value of 10% or 0.1. But what happens if we had a much higher contamination value, say we had 0.4? So let's just have a look at that and see what it does. So if I change that to 0.4, rerun that model, fit the model, and then create the columns again. And if we come back down to our plot, we can then run that, and we can see that we've got much more points identified as outliers, and very few points identified as inliers. So we can see these two distinct clusters here and here. So this value of 0.4 or 40% is quite a high value, and it's more than what I would expect for this particular type of data. So how do we know which contamination value to set? Well, it's dependent upon how well we know the data. If we're familiar with this data set, which I am, then we know what value to select for that. However, it may just be a case of trial and error, or you could speak to the person that has provided the data and try to understand how many data points they expect to be considered as outliers. So now that we've seen the basics of using isolation for us with just two variables, let's see what happens when we use a few more. So here I'm going to select an additional four inputs, GR, Kali, PEF, and DTC. So now we've got a combined total of six inputs. And this is much better as we're using more variables to identify whether points are outliers and we're doing this in multi-dimensional space rather than within just 2D or two dimensions. So as before, we select our anomaly inputs and then we're just going to build a model and fit the model and create two new columns, anomaly scores and anomaly. And I'll set the contamination value to 0.1. So if we run that, and then view our outlier plot. So we could view the two dimensions that we have here, and we can see that we've got a similar number of points that we had before, about 1,300 points uh, when we were used 10% above. And then we've got the inliers, and we can see that we've got points now that are within the main cluster or main cloud of data points. And this is because other points within the data set have been identified as outliers, and they correspond to these points that are identified here. So instead of just looking at the two dimensions or two variables, we can look at all of the variables that we have used. And the simplest way to do that is to use a seaborne pair plot. So first I'm going to set the palette and I'm going to select these two colors. This one corresponds to the orange and this one corresponds to the blue so that we have a plot that we can easily compare with this 2D plot. Then I'm going to call upon the pair plot, pass in the data frame and then pass in our variables, anomaly inputs and then set the hue to anomaly and then our palette to what we created up here. So once that cell has run, we then get back the pair plot and we can see all of our variables, N5, row B, GR, etc., all along the Y axis and same again on the X axis. So this just allows us to compare all of the variables with each other. And along the diagonal, we have our kernel density estimation and that just shows what the distribution of our values. So we have our outliers in orange and our inliers or good points in blue. So we can see that we've got the same data here, N5 and row B within this particular cell, and it corresponds to this value here. It's just that axes are inverted on the y-axis. And we can see some of the other variables such as GR, we've got very high anomalous values here. Same with PE, we've got values way up to 300 when we should have them down in, in the range of between 0 and 20. So we've got quite high values here, and these have been identified as outliers or anomalous data points. And we can see the inverse of these, so we're plotting the PEF against Cali. So if we look at the caliper values, we've got quite a wide range here. So that indicates we've probably got a different uh, hole sizes, and we may have a few points here that have been, been caused by borehole washout. So again, we would need to look at a log plot to understand whether these points are truly outliers or not. And there we have it, we have seen how to use isolation for us to identify outliers within our data set. If you've enjoyed today's video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content from this channel, click on that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.